Hello and welcome back and that is right today I want to talk about why NAS is always going to be better than cloud aka NAS gonna live forever so in this video I'm going to give you five very clear reasons why NAS will always be better than cloud as far as I am concerned but before we go any further a few disclaimers number one I'm not that much of a moron I'm a bit of a moron but I'm not that much of a moron that is brand I know there is a place for cloud and we will talk about later on in the video there's lots of ways in which the cloud can actually be better than NAS and maybe I'll save that for another video but ultimately both platforms NAS and in this case by NAS I mean private server ownership so that can be turnkey or DIY there's lots of ways that I'm going to talk about why that is the preferred method preferred overall compared with going just plain cloud in these five reasons although not each of them not each of them are 100 conclusive i would say they are like 99 conclusive and if you are an existing cloud user i think you could stand to benefit to look how the wind is changing but without further ado let's crack on with number one how about new the confidence you have of data when it is in the cloud on a third party cloud server being deleted, I don't think anyone could say that faith is 100%. I refuse to accept that. I think originally when I was writing the script for this video, I wrote down faith in deletion, cloud deletion equals 99.99% sure. To be honest, I don't even think it's that high. Realistically, I think most users are pretty sure the data is deleted or at the very least very hard to get to if you've got a few gig of data on a dropbox or a google drive or even something bigger aws some sort of block blob type storage and you delete it how confident are you that it's gone you're pretty sure aren't you but you know that those data centers are on big old server farms you know there are um, backups of backups of backups of backups so not only is there a good chance that the data the data backup and the daily rotation hasn't synchronized that deletion across the whole platform but on top of that just because it's been removed from the index doesn't mean that it's fully gone now in the case of nas a lot of detractors may turn around and say oh when you click delete on dsm or qts how do you know it's deleted maybe maybe it's still on the disk and you know what you're right but you know what i can't do with a cloud i can't f up a drive that's right if you choose to unlike when data's on the cloud i can take a drive and properly mess it up. I can smash the drive so much that although the platters exist in fragments, those platter fragments are going to be real tough to put together. And therefore, when it comes to cloud versus NAS, if I want 100% certainty of deletion, this is the way I go. I can go into the index, I can zero every single bit across the drive, I can then remove it from the NAS, I can drown it, burn it, smash it, hung, draw and quarter it, and ultimately... Uh, NAS solutions be they turnkey or DIY has 100% deletion guarantee if you want to have it in a way that cloud I don't think anyone with their hand on their heart will ever truly believe how about new this is a point I genuinely don't hear spoken about a lot online, even though it affects, I would argue, smaller, lower tier users than it does big business. But data compression on cloud is everywhere. And when you are backing up data to the cloud, even when you're using, you know, your Google phone, your iPhone, and it's backing up, then it's like, oh, do you want to compress these or not? And you click no. In a lot of cases, your data is still being compressed and data on the cloud that gets compressed over time and then later on when you retrieve it you are still not certain what you are getting is the original fully fledged version i've uploaded and downloaded files from the cloud and somehow the size of the file down to the bytes has changed not loads but it's still changed and when you are storing data online sometimes that compression can break things sometimes the data being stored in that fashion on mass not so much in a database form but definitely if you're running large scale command or large scale data storage where the actual you know not so much bit rot but the positioning of the zeros and the ones is incredibly important data on cloud gets compressed a lot of the time without you even knowing now turnkey diy nas 
They've got compression options. Hell, ZFS or QUTS, when it's using ZFS, has got inline compression, inline deduplication as well, and it has inline compaction as well. And those are options you can just turn off. And the idea is that you've got the control for that to happen or not. And when things are on the cloud, yes, there are certain user controls on some storage platforms that are direct data bucket type storage where you can enable or disable compression, at least on the front end. There are loads of data storage methods built into cloud where it is mandatory that data will be compressed. Go into the TNC and a lot of these cloud platforms, the smaller ones predominantly, do not give you the account control to disable compaction and compression of data when they go onto those cloud services, which sometimes can undermine the original data, particularly photo and video, of course, but databases and large scale data where the changes of a few zeros and ones, or at least an unknown, can lead to that data not to being what you originally created. How about new? This is one I talk about a lot, and it is definitely a misnomer when it comes to internet speeds. But NAS, again, turnkey or DIY, will always, always, always be faster than cloud. What do I mean by that? Well, when you're dealing with cloud storage, and again, Google Drive, Dropbox, you know, your Apple storage, all of those different storage platforms, you are limited by a few things. One of the main limitations is your upload and your download speeds from your internet service provider. Now, your internet service provider may say you've got gigabit internet speeds, you've got two gigabit internet speeds, but one, they generally always tell you the download speed, so that's retrieving data. The upload speed is always a fraction of that. Then you have fair usage policies to other people that live in your neighborhood, uh, and therefore those users if you know, during particularly peak busy times, you may be throttled in your connection. These are all things you're already aware of. But the thing you may not be aware of is when it comes to those cloud storage platforms, even if you've got gigabit internet speeds, it doesn't matter if the data that's being delivered to and from the cloud server itself and the distance you are from that cloud server all play a part in the slow whittling down of those speeds. Overall, it means that even though internet speeds are getting bigger and better and faster, the connection you have with remote cloud storage isn't actually improving in anywhere near the same scaling. Now, when it comes to a local network attached storage device like the devices you see here on the table, one, I can take an ethernet cable, a standard network cable, connect into a switch or just stick it into my laptop, stick it into the NAS, I've got 109 megabytes per second, easy, straight away. And getting 109 megabytes per second on an internet connected cloud drive requires some serious whack money going down and definitely storage uh, tiers with those cloud service providers that give you priority. But 2.5G to five gig adapters, 2.5G to two and a half inch adapters, this one's 15 pounds. They allow me to have 279 megabytes per second or 550 give or take megabytes per second there 15 pounds 40 pounds for an upgrade there yes i need both the client device and the nas device to have those connections but again it's not that expensive is it and suddenly i am getting insanity level speeds but why stop there upgrade to 10 gbe upgrade to 20 gbe upgrade with SSDs and NVMEs to make sure the system can still output those performance speeds. You try getting a thousand megabytes per second from a cloud drive. Try it, I dare you. Let me know how much that costs you per month. And it's, you can get 1000 megabytes per second NASes for your you and your data for four to 500 quid. I've seen NAS devices like the Asus Store Flash Store um, uh, 12 that's got um, 12 M2 NVMe bays inside with 10 GBE and that device is 800 NICA. Now, yes, you still got to put the drives inside and that's all going to cost you money. But there's still no avoiding that right now when it comes to getting real performance speeds, cl cloud services are never going to be able to touch the speeds of NAS. How about new? This next point I know is going to spark controversy, debate, and argument there in the comments. Ah, oh, shit. 
here we go again. But frankly, I do genuinely believe this. I think security on network attached storage devices, turnkey or DIY, both of these are just better than they are when you're using cloud drives. What do I mean by that? Well, it actually breaks down into several things. Number one, when you are accessing data via the internet on a cloud service, you're not the only one that can use a URL, mate. You're not the only one that can type in www. Now, yes, there's two-step authentication. There's IP logging. There is, um, we've not seen this device before. They are using authenticators. There are a multitude of different security uh, options that can be between you and your storage area to stop you getting in. But does anyone remember what happened with Linus when they got hacked in? That happened because of security tokens. Watch out, uh, look at Tom uh, on Lawrence Systems' video on that. Um, it was to do with Google security tokens being held in the browser. That if you can replicate that and replicate the, the system um, config, you can get in. Now, yes, it is arguable that maybe you could do that with a NAS. Of course you could. Most of these NAS systems, whether it is you're going DIY and you're using something like Tailscale, or if you're using, say, Unraid's own uh, remote access uh, membership program to get into your NAS, or if you're using Synology with Quick Connect, you're using QNAP with my QNAP Cloud. Yes, all of these can create a way in which your NAS has an identity on the internet. And yes, there is IP logging. Yes, two-step authentication, authenticators, this device recognition, all that stuff. All of those are in case. But do you know what NAS has that cloud doesn't? It's got a cable that I can just pull out. I can ensure that not only I can pull a little network cable out the back of my NAS to ensure that it is not accessible by anyone but me, or indeed anyone at all, but I can ensure that my NAS and all of my devices are on a closed network that has no internet connectivity. And when I do that, that ensures that no one is getting in that data but me. And that is something I just can't have with cloud. There is no way for me to create a cloud that's got one door that I control. I can control a door and I can add lots of locks to that door, but there is no way for me to ensure I'm the only one with access to the door and that I'm the only one that can turn it off or remove it entirely. And that is why DIY NAS for me will always feel like the not only the most secure, uh, DIYs and turnkey NAS will not only be the most secure platform on balance, but on top of that, it's the one that gives me a better degree of control over that security compared with cloud. How about new? And finally, and I mean this when I say, cloud services in a lot of cases are a complete false economy. If you're someone, home or business user, that's got a lot of data that you're gonna need to store for at least three to five years, going for cloud, you're just hemorrhaging money. And overall, at the end, you're gonna to need to buy a NAS anyway. Let me explain. Let's say you got two terabytes of data. You got two TB to play with there. Now. If you go for a cloud, let's go for iCloud. Um, you can get two TB of storage on iCloud for a tenner a month. So that's 120 nicker a year you've just spent. In three years, you've spent 360 nicker for 200 uh, for two terabytes of storage. Now, here is the TS133. You can pick that up for about 120 quid, or you can go to Synology and get their one bay, the DS120J or the DS123, which I believe is still on its way, or the 124 even. That will set you back between, for the J-series model, about 80 quid, and if you go for the other model, the higher Realtek model there, that's about 120 to 130 quid. A 2TB drive, it's about 30 to 40 pounds, give or take, when you're really shopping around. So you've spent about, let's call it 200 quid, let's go nuts. If you wanna get a two bay, the couple of drives, you're looking at about 250 to 300 quid. And remember, You've just spent £360 on 2TB of Apple storage for three years, okay? So on the one hand, you might be going, well, what about the electricity? Rob, you didn't talk about the electricity. You're talking pennies a week, if not a month. But on top of that, after those three years of that data being on uh, iCloud, what next? Where's that data going? You're just going to delete it, or do you still need to store it? Well, in that case, if you're going to store it for another year, that's another 120 pounds, please. Thank you, I'm Apple. Another year, that's another 120. Let's be realistic, they've upped the prices by then. And you spent a little bit more. Now, had you bought the NAS at the beginning, you've still got the NAS. 
The drives have got three, in some cases five years of warranty. The systems have got two to three years of warranty that can be extended if you really wanted to, but you've still got the data here. Now we're at five years. At this point, you've now spent 600 pounds on that 2TB over the course of five years. Remember, you spent between 150 to 300 nicker, depending on the configuration of ones and two bays and the drives for exactly the same amount of storage on this. What are you doing after those five years with the data on your Apple uh, Apple Cloud? Deleting it? You're going to up the storage? You're going to have to remove it. What are you going to buy? You're going to download it to a USB drive? Fine, but now you can't access it remotely. So what do you end up buying? You buy a server anyway. And that's the point I'm making. And that is on the smallest scale. Imagine you're a business user with client data, and insurance commitments, GDPR commitments to stay on top of, sales records, purchasing records, staffing, HR, surveillance. Trying to use the cloud for all of those in the short term is bloody convenient. In the long term, you are hemorrhaging money. It's just not worth it. And with NAS devices, be they DIY or turnkey, getting increasingly more expandable over time, upgradable in the drives. So if you need to, you can remove the drive, put in a bigger drive and just increase your storage that way. It just is just another one of the many reasons why um, DIY and turnkey NAS solutions are always gonna be better than cloud. But like I said in the intro, this is not black and white. And for most users, and I believe this, having a hybrid tiered storage solution is better. Having a standard server, be it turnkey or DIY, accompanied with a small area of cloud to only utilize as part of your 321 backup strategy makes sense. Utilizing things like MyQNAP Cloud One or using Synology C2 service, which is the first party cloud service integrated within their system, could also be beneficial. But also, all of these NAS platforms, and again, Turnkey uh, or DIY as well, also arrive with synchronization tools to connect or bolt on or mount or just plain synchronize all of the popular third party cloud services out there to that. They understand that they need to work with cloud service providers to create that hybrid storage uh, solution rather than trying to fight against them. But this video has been about which one should be for your primary storage. And when it comes to that, NAS gone a NAS. So straight as that. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Maybe there are points that I've not covered or you disagree with my points. Head to the comments and let me know. But just remember, think before you comment that you're not the only user in the world and your data isn't the only data in the world and just think about the broader spectrum of users before you comment but apart from that thank you so much for watching if you're still on the fence about what solution you need use the free advice section on, over on nas compares the big blue button on the right side of the page use the discord or the ask nas compares community support forum on top of that we've got our new nas builder which is specifically tailored to building your own nas and knowing the kind of what you can do with it before spending a single penny anywhere. On top of that, you can take advantage of uh, Ko-Fi and Patreon to not only get expedited support from me and Eddie, but on top of that, you can go ahead and sign up for our monthly Zooms uh, and seminars, access to videos early if you're part of our Inner Circle uh, collection, and of course, stay abreast of all things happening in storage. And finally, I've linked to a number of guides below on choosing the best NAS solution for your needs. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.